Thank you. I was planning to do this in Japanese, but I've been told that this is being recorded and it's going to be put up on the YouTube, only the English version. So I'm going to speak in English. Be uh, here. Uh, I was told just right before we started that we're actually recording these talks and that only the English version will be used on the YouTube. So if I were actually to do the presentation in Japanese, you'd be getting video of me, but with the translator's voice. So we'll do it in English. Um, but either one's fine by me. So um, let's bring up the uh, slides, shall we? Quantum airliners, whole stack quantum computer development. I assume most of you recognize that picture that's up there, right? The Wright brothers, 1903. First human powered controlled plane flight, right? The Wright brothers did a lot of things when they were working. They had to design their own airfoil shape, that is the, the profile of the wing. They had to design their own propeller. They had to design their own gasoline engine. But their biggest innovation was probably the overall 3D control system that they developed. Because prior to the Wright brothers, many people thought that the way you would control an airplane was essentially by ice skating in the air. Two-dimensional, need you get. But the, the Wright brothers recognized that it's actually a three-dimensional problem. That you have to deal with power and control in, in an entirely uh, three-dimensional fashion. So they did everything themselves. Um, as it happens, they also were, in modern terms, essentially closed source people. They were big on patents and protect protecting their, their own commercial secrets for what they were doing. Their rival, Samuel Langley, who was director of the, the Smithsonian Institution at the time, um, he was what we would now call a, uh, an open source or open science advocate. And he was also trying to build his own airplane, and the Wright brothers actually won. They got their, they got their airplane in, in the air first. But arguably, they impeded the, the, uh, the development of the aviation industry in the United States, and that the center of innovation moved from uh, the United States to Europe for a couple of decades. Right. Contrast that to this. This is what it takes to build an airliner today. And parts of this airplane come from... Uh, Japan, you know, Fuji here in Japan, from Mitsubishi here in Japan, parts of it are actually built in Oklahoma, parts are built in France, parts are built in Ohio. This is the level of system that we are talking about in terms of you know, what it means to build an airplane today. Okay. Um, so, the question is, um, what are we going to do, how does this relate to quantum computing? And just a brief introduction of myself. Um, I have been working now in this field for literally 20 years. So I have, over that time, coordinated with a whole bunch of different people and collaborated with researchers from all around the world. Uh, and this is my current group where I am out at the Keio University Shonan Fujisawa campus. We, we now represent about 35 people from a dozen different countries, including a number of really fantastic undergraduate students and uh, a number of very uh, of equally fantastic graduate students. And so for those of you who are employers and are looking for quantum expertise, please, you know, hire my people. All right, so where are we today? Well, we are in an environment with early qubits. Right? And we would like to have more application bits. We would like to have more application qubits for, for these systems. But in order for them to be useful, we actually also have to have much higher fidelity. So we are now in the era of what we call NISC. Everyone's heard about uh, NISC, Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum Systems, and various and sundry work is going on to extend that, uh, that, that NISC concept. Some people are building larger systems with more qubits in them. Some are working very hard to reduce the noise in the, in the quantum systems. And the very first fault-tolerant demonstrations are really being conducted right around now in, in, uh, various, in, in various laboratories around the world. As we go, we're going to improve the quality of our error correction, uh, which is written there as longer code distances. We'll be adding more fault-tolerant uh, qubits, and eventually we'll get to the point where we have what I call max SQ, the maximum number of, fault of logical qubits you can fit into a single chip, because the chips are, are, are of a limited size. So beyond that, we need to get to 
systems that interconnect a smaller number of quantum computers and build large-scale, fault-tolerant quantum computers. And so those interconnects are, are just as important as the development of other aspects of the hardware. So today we are here at, at essentially the Wright Brothers level of machines. They're real, they work, they're, hand, uh, they're, they're an incredible accomplishment, and they're also hand-built by small teams. We need to get to where those airliners are. Right? So the question is, how do you get from the, from the Wright Brothers to where the air, to, uh, to an airliner? I assume many, many of you work for hardware manufacturers, and so you probably know the term BOM or BOM cost, right? It's your bill of materials. In order to build a large-scale system, you're going to need all of these kinds of things. And somewhere up on that board, there, on that screen, there is written the word quantum chips or quantum processors. But that's not the only thing. You need all of these components. You need dilution re refrigerators, which will require the refrigerants themselves and pumps and tubing and things like that. You'll need coaxial cables and classical support systems that work at low temperatures. You'll need specialized ASICs. You're going to need signal generators. You're going to need clean rooms for doing all of this and fabrication equipment that makes all of this work, right? So it's not just about building those individual processors. Moreover, there's a lot of software that you need equivalently, right? Not just hardware, but the size of the software is also big. And each one of these lines that's written on here is not actually one thing. Each one of these lines is actually has many components in, inside of it as well. So when you total all of this up, it's a lot of work. Right? Let's divide these out into a set of, in, in to regroup these uh, somewhat. The way that we'll group them, we'll say that those at the top up there in red, that's essentially writing the application for, uh, the, that the user, the, your application programmer is trying to write. In yellow, that's writing the experiment. In green, that's running the experiment, which is mostly owned by the, by the vendors themselves, by um, you know, IBM or Quantinium or whoever you're working with. And then uh, at the bottom in purple is the future of quantum software engineering. And one of the key questions is how much of this can we leverage from existing classical work? Now, I used the word uh, experiment here, and that was deliberate. Um, Dave Farber, who some of you may know, he's a professor at KO but he's right now, but he's been many places. He is the grandfather of the classical internet. Um, I showed him some kids' kid code uh, a couple of years ago, complete with all the job management and everything. And Dave's response to this was, that's not an application, it's an experiment. So the question then is, how do we get from experiments to applications? Well, uh, I showed you a picture of my own research group a minute ago. This is actually the KO uh, University Quantum Computing Center, for which I am vice center chair. And we have a number of member companies who are actually joining with us to actually work on applications for quantum com computers. And what happens is KO and IBM bring, we contribute the quantum expertise and those companies bring the, the problem domain expertise. And so we're working together to actually solve these problems. That's the right approach for actually dealing, for actually getting from experiments to systems that people, and applications that people actually use in the real world. All right, so let's go very, very quickly just over, over some of the kinds of research things that my own research group actually does and that, that I think actually lead us in the right direction. We are effectively working on every aspect of quantum computing we can get our hands on. Um, I showed a, a picture of my group to, to another researcher uh, recently and, and uh, he said, wow, you've got a really large group. And then I explained uh, all of the work that we're doing for him and he said, you don't have enough people. Right, so we work on quantum computation, we work on quantum communication, we work on education, and we work on community. Those, I think, are essentially the four major pillars of where we need to go as a community in order to, to build an entire ecosystem that will allow us to build those quantum airliners. So within that, we have a number of different projects, and I'm not going to explain these projects to you. You can look up our website and you can look up the work that we're doing if you like but it's funded by a, a number of uh, Japanese government agencies as well as American government agencies, and we also have some work that's actually funded by um, uh, uh, commercial uh, enterprises as well. And so first, let me show you just a little bit about the kinds of computational problems that we're actually solving. Well, you all have seen machines like this, right? 
we're actually working on um, how to use machines like this. Um, but one aspect of it, the machines right now are getting big faster than they are getting good. So what happens if you have a whole set of applications you actually want to run a machine, and each of these individual applications is actually kind of small, but you want to run them all? Well, you know, normally you would have to run them individually one by one on a machine, but maybe we can actually take a set of them and we can actually put them on the machine at the same time. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Well, the problem is that if you put them right next to each other on the machine, like is drawn here, they're actually going to interfere with each other. Each other. You'll get crosstalk between the applications, and um, that will reduce the fidelity of your overall results. So what we have proposed, and uh, publication of, uh, about this has already been uh, published in the IEEE Transactions on Quantum Engineering, is to insert what we call a buffer qubit um, in between the, uh, the, uh, the different circuits that are actually being run. Moreover, another task that we're actually working on is the quantum software development life cycle and other aspects of this overall problem. Um, one of the biggest challenges is how do you understand what's going on with your quantum algorithm or your quantum program and figure out how to actually debug it when errors actually occur? How do you deal with this overall life cycle, including you know, the full planning and production and debugging and update and documentation of everything else? Right? Well, one aspect of this we're working on is actually steps toward a full-scale quantum debugger. Um, this is work by my PhD student, Sarah Methwali, which appeared in last year's I, um, IEEE Quantum Week conference, also known as uh, QCE. So that's one step that we're taking in that direction. Um, another direct step that we are taking in that direction is actually working on compilers for, for fault-tolerant systems. So we're trying to leap ahead of the current work on NISC systems here and um, do work for applications and compile the applications once the, the, uh, we have real large-scale fault-tolerant systems. And this is work done in conjunction with the University of Technology Sydney down in Australia as well as with, as with Zapata, which is a US-based uh, startup company. And that will appear in this year's uh, IEEE Quantum Week, which will be held in September in uh, Seattle. Our job within that is to build on top of this paper that was published a few years ago, which in turn builds upon a notion uh, known as lattice surgery, which was developed in my group as well as with a couple of other researchers, with Austin Fowler and Simon DeWitt, um, over a decade ago now. Right? So within this, our job as a research group is to take that graph that appears on the left, which is a partially compiled representation of a quantum program, and map it to the thing on the right, which is a complicated visual representation of a particular way of executing algorithms on top of fault-tolerant systems. Now, I'm not going to explain all of this to you because, in fact, going through all of this would take you know, hours. But to give you the general idea, you know, this is a, uh, a compilation-related problem and also, an, importantly, a graph theory-related problem. All right, so what about the education stuff that we're actually doing? We put a course up on a MOOC platform, an online platform known as FutureLearn, uh, back in 2017. Uh, the numbers that are on this slide are actually well out of date, but uh, it's available now, uh, Understanding Quantum Computers, and it's available in Nihongo, Taigo, Indonesia, -go, um, and we've got some work for uh, planning for additional translations. We are also involved in a Japanese government uh, ed education program known as QLEAP, within which our responsibility is quantum communications. And all of this work we are making available Creative Commons. The videos are available on YouTube in both English and in Japanese. And um, that will help you, I think, move forward. In addition, in the community area, um, I believe in contributing back to the community. So we have the IEEE Transactions on Quantum Engineering. Um, the, I am now editor-in-chief of that particular journal. So let me tell you just in a couple of minutes about the work we are doing on uh, communication. So there are fundamentally two different kinds of quantum networks. There are entangled quantum networks, 
and then just single photon networks known as quantum key distribution networks. Interestingly, the core ideas for both go all the way back to the 1980s, but uh, the, the QKD networks have been much quicker to develop over the last couple of decades than the entangled networks. But the entangled networks are actually being developed uh, at a tremendous rate just within the last couple of years with some fabulous uh, work that's, that's taking place, including some taking place in my group and in a larger group that's, uh, that, that's uh, headed by um, Dr. Shota Nagayama, um, and that's part of the, uh, the Japanese government's Moonshot project. So, um, what can you do with a quantum network? Well, you can do problems like distributed cryptographic functions, which will help with improving the security of systems. You can run sensor networks that will allow for higher precision um, tasks of various sorts, and you can run distributed computation. And these are just some of the applications that can actually be run on top of that, and they will provide better systems uh, for, or higher precision work that, that for um, particular tasks than, than can be done classically. At least that's the goal, that's the vision. So for example, some of these reduce our dependency on in cryptographic terms, public key cryptography, one-way functions, and computational complexity. For example, one of the things in the sensor network area, actually, is um, to use quantum entanglement to improve the precision or the resolution of long baseline interferometry. So uh, kanshoke uh, is, the, uh, is the area in which we're working there. Our group is working on not only theory for these things, but actually also software, including a, uh, a simulator known as Quisp, which is available as open source on GitHub. Um, if you are interested in such things, please feel free to work with, the, with the, uh, the simulator and tell us what you like about it and give us contributions back to it. We would love to have those. So within all of that, not only are we actually doing simulation and theory work, but we're part of this group known as the Quantum Inter Internet Task Force, headed by Shota Nagayama, who's right there in the middle of this, um, leading this entire effort to build a testbed network here in Japan, uh, known as the Quantum Internet Task Force. And we also do work with the Internet Research Task Force, which is a worldwide um, organization of researchers who are advancing the overall work of the classical internet. Within that, there is a research group known as the Quantum Internet Research Group. Anyone can join the mailing list. Anyone can participate in this. And currently, there are over 400 people worldwide who are working on this. I co-chair this with uh, Dr. Wojtek Kozlowski, who is from the Technical University of Delft. And so it's a worldwide collaborative effort, effort on doing this. Moreover, we have a draft textbook that is available that is titled simply Quantum Communications. Um, that is, the draft is available today on GitHub, and it will be appearing on the archive in a PDF form, hopefully very soon. So, with all of that, that brings us back to where we started, evolving quantum hardware and our, involving, our evolving environment. We need to get from these early qubit systems here in the lower left up to what's going on up there in the upper right. We need to get to large-scale, fault-tolerant quantum computers. And the question is, for you is, what is your core competency? What is it that you bring to the table that you contribute to getting us from the Wright Brothers era of a hand-built, beautiful, custom machine to this large-scale effort, this large-scale system that you can put 400 people or 600 people on and it just flies and everything runs just perfectly. So um, within that context, right, this is not something that can be, this, uh, can be done by a single company or by just you know, a small research group in a university. In order to do this, we need a worldwide effort. I showed you earlier all of the different places that those subsystems of an airliner come from. I believe the same thing will be happening worldwide with, with, uh, with the quantum computing effort. We're going to need contributions from companies in Japan and the United States and Europe and Australia and um, Southeast Asia and everywhere else. We're going to need a whole lot of this. And with that um, effort in mind, I believe that will help us advance in quantum computation, quantum communications, quantum education, and um, quantum community. And with that, my final words are 
my recommendation for you is to go quantum native. Thank you all. Thank you.